Hello, welcome to The Eclectic Reader. Listen to great books and stories while you use your eyes and hands for other things. Now here's your host, Madison Mason. Hi, Madison Mason here. I'm so glad you like The Eclectic Reader. This is The Great Quarry Boys, Chapter 43. The Gray Quarry Boys, Chapter 43, Lorraine Scanlon. Lorraine Scanlon had been smacked around all her life. She accepted it as the way to live. Her mother beat her unmercifully when she got pregnant at 15. For a mill hand, her father was surprisingly compassionate toward his youngest daughter's condition. But her shamed mother was unrelenting in her rage and drove her out of the house with a belt. Lorraine lived with her brother and his wife until Buddy was born. Buddy's father was one of those Jefferson City boys the local girls were so impressed by, and when his parents found out what had happened, his father enlisted him in the army. He went to Korea to become a man. Lorraine never saw him again, and Buddy never saw him at all. She dropped out of school and worked to raise little Buddy. She landed a job at the towel mill where she met Ralph Scanlon. They started drinking early, as a lot of kids did, and one drunk night decided they would head down to Rock Hill, South Carolina, and get married. Buddy was five when Ralph became his stepfather. Ralph resented him from the outset, but he was the only father Buddy ever knew. Lorraine didn't want to do anything to rock the boat, so Buddy James grew up unwanted, unnoticed, and unloved, until Sue Marie came along. When Sue Marie went to Europe, he was lost for what to do. He worked odd jobs for pocket money, cleaned the house to earn his keep, and spent all his time alone. He was more different than ever now, and the Friday night he stole Benny Morse's bike to ride over to the street dance in Charity, ten miles away, was the night his life changed forever. Once a year, the town of Charity, living up to its name, threw a street dance on its two-block main street. They built a bandstand at one end of the town, strung colored lights up and down the street, and opened the town to all comers. Farmers and mill hands, merchants and kids came from all the surrounding towns to dance and have fun. Buddy parked Benny's bike behind the Esso station and ambled into the crowded street of dancers, gabbers, and laughing girls. The band was playing Tennessee Waltz, and two hundred heads swayed in rhythm under the colored lights. Buddy stood in the shadow of the bandstand and blew his harp along with the fiddles. The drummer heard him over the other instruments and motioned to him to climb up and play. Buddy was hesitant, but the drummer persisted, so Buddy trod the steps onto the plywood platform to play softly beside the drums. One of the old fiddle players grinned and nodded with his straw cowboy hat to join them at the mic. Next thing Buddy knew, he was between the two fiddlers, pulling on his harp, wailing his lonely pain to the dancers. I remember the night and the Tennessee wall. The two fiddlers nodded at each other and smiled. The kid was good. When the song ended, they patted Buddy on the shoulders and said, You done good, bud. He nodded shyly and climbed down. People on the street looked at him with welcome eyes, and it felt so good he decided to stay and try to have fun. That night, Ralph and Lorraine had a fight over nothing, patched it up in an hour, and decided not to go over to charity for the street dance, but grab a few beers and some food at Jerry's Pistol Lounge. They walked into the bar about nine and were slammed by the noise of the jukebox and the drunk crowd. Over the pool table hung an old Colt 45 and the countywide famous sign, Welcome to Jerry's Pistol Lounge. Drink till 12, pistol 2. They found a table in the corner beside the pool table and ordered a pitcher of beer. Ralph wanted chicken fried steak and fries, and Lorraine got her fish and chips, and they settled in for a night of drinking, laughing, and yelling over the din of the bar at Friends. About 11.30, events shifted in the wrong direction. After their fourth pitcher of beer, Lorraine was struck with the call of the woods and staggered off to the ladies' room. The glare of a naked bulb and the stench were the shock she didn't need, and the fact Jerry didn't take better care of his facilities annoyed her. She toughed it out, took care of business, and determined to give old Jerry a piece of her mind. 
As she staggered back into the dark bar, she accidentally bumped someone and said, excuse me, and shouldered her way through the crowd to her table. Suddenly, a sharp pain in the back of her head brought stars to her eyes, and she felt a wet slosh across her shoulders. Her hand went instinctively to her head as she turned. She was drenched and stank of beer. Her hand came back bloody. It dawned on her that someone hit her in the head with a beer bottle. She didn't have to figure out who it was. She was face to face with a tough, stringy creature who looked more man than woman. Watch out where you go, white trash. What? Lorraine wondered aloud. You messed up my shot, you stupid bitch, the man-woman sneered. You skag! In her rage, she dropped all caution. This was a mistake. The skag swung her pool cue like she had a 300 average. It caught Lorraine alongside the head and she went down across the floor into the wall in a shower of stars. When she came to, the butch skag was stepping forward for a strike too. Lorraine was a bitter mother-beaten girl, and no woman was ever going to best her again. She jumped up, grabbed a beer mug from a table, and slammed it into the woman's face. Then she pounced on the stunned skag, claws extended like a panther, grabbed her short hair, and pounded her with both fists. Insane now. The woman screeched and clawed at Lorraine's eyes. Somewhere in the distance, Lorraine heard Ralph's voice yelling her name but the male crowd had leaped into a circle around them and were wildly cheering them on. The woman shoved her away, broke a bottle, and stalked forward. Lorraine looked quickly around and snatched a steak knife from a plate, and as the woman lunged at her, Lorraine brought the knife down across her shoulder. The woman screamed as the falling blade slid so close to her face it sliced off her ear. She staggered back, holding her hand to her severed ear, White trash whore, I'm gonna kill you! She came at Lorraine, swinging wildly with the broken bottle, and cut her arms and shoulder. Lorraine stabbed the knife into the woman's chest until the woman stopped coming and slumped to the floor, wheezing blood. Everything after that was a blur. Ralph, arms pinning her, yelling, the knife clanked from her hand, her head throbbing, highway patrol in the room, guns, handcuffs, ambulance, hospital, stitches, jail. Buddy arrived back in Gray Quarry around one in the morning. The town was asleep as he silently returned Benny Morse's bike to his yard and went home. His own house was dark and silent as he tiptoed to his room. He needn't have bothered. Lorraine and Ralph were at the jail in Jefferson City. Buddy didn't know he was alone. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of The Eclectic Reader. Please go on to the next numbered episode to continue. Also, check us out on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. If you'd like to help support the project, you can donate under Madison Mason at Patreon. And please, check out our website, kltkrdr.com, for more information. Hi, this is Madison Mason. I want to personally thank you for listening to The Eclectic Reader and invite you to share your experience, your thoughts, and your suggestions. We have many great books lined up for the future, but if you have requests for anything that is in the public domain, please email us at kltkrdr at gmail.com. kltkrdr at gmail.com